Okay, I'll start now. Uh, thanks again for the invitation. Um, I hope all of you can put yourself in a position that you accept all these sentences here. You are allowed to change this one. In, for instance, um, Italians are good soccer players or something, if you prefer that. But it's, you have to keep the, you can change this and this, but you have to keep the word good there. Or bad is also good, by the way. It's very special, the Okay, and then, um, so I hope you can do that, and then wonder why you, how you can accept all these. They're so different in the sense that um, vertebrates, definitely not all birds can fly. Only half of them at most play eggs. This is only about somehow, it's not about all Dutchmen, it's actually only about Dutch sailors at best. Here, well, this maybe. Maybe you don't know this, but the fact is that only 5% of the mosquitoes, even of malaria, the mosquitoes we call malaria mosquitoes, carry malaria. There's no elephant that lives in Africa and India. And this somehow, well, this no boy that doesn't cry. And this somehow gets a sort of normative ring. So how does that come about? And then once, you, once you've wondered about that, then, oh, sorry. Wonder about, you accept this, but you don't accept this. And here, you don't accept that. There's only one exception. And still you don't accept it. Whereas there are many birds, okay, so how can you do that? Well, I, I will, I hopefully, if I have time enough, I will try to explain all that to you. And um, the reason I got interested in it, well, all these, all these examples are already, I think, in Greg Carlson's thesis, the early 80s, even the end of the 70s, a beautiful, beautiful dissertation. Uh, he has this kind of theory that explains a lot, <coughs> where basically you, you solve this by saying, well, listen, here we are predicating things of kinds rather than of individuals. I don't disagree with that, but unfortunately, his theory doesn't give us any clue to the logical properties of these sentences. Because what comes out of it as logical force is only at most two, or at least two, sorry, I forgot. Well, that's, I will illustrate that these sentences have a very, very, very interesting logic. Uh, but to do all that, you have to sort of say farewell to truth conditional semantics um, and do something more in the line of dynamic semantics here is the basic um, idea of, well, you all know how, in truth conditional semantics, you know the meaning of a sentence if you know its truth condition. That one should be replaced by this one. You know the meaning of a sentence if you know the change it brings about in the intentional, with a T, state of anyone who wants to incorporate the information conveyed by it. with all its disadvantages, but okay, we'll see how it works out. So this is formally a bit of notation that I will use every now and then. So the meaning of a sentence then becomes an operation on uh, information states or intentional states. And I will use this notation. So as followed by, oh, can you see it when I point there at the, it's no problem? Okay. This notation I will use for the intentional state that results when 
the state as it's updated with phi. Okay? Then the logic, the notion of a, an important notion is the notion of support. So a state supports a certain sentence, but this can also be, doesn't have to be a declarative, it can also be uh, a question or a, or an even an, uh, or an, a command or something. Supports a sentence if when you update the state with the sentence, you get it back. So it's already there in some sense. Okay? And then logical validity is defined as follows. An argument is valid if updating any state with the premises yields a state that supports the conclusion. Okay, you are in a certain state, you learn the premises, and when you do that properly, then you're sort of forced to accept the conclusion. Okay, that's here. And then this notion of presupposition, <coughs> a sentence phi presupposes the sentence psi. If this is defined only if psi is accepted in S. So the, this, this is a different notion than the one you heard this morning because this is not speaker-oriented, but hearer-oriented. It says a sentence is presupposed if the hearer, the addressee, cannot update, that means cannot process the sentence unless he accepts the presupposed thing. Okay? That's the original, if you look at the literature, that's, that's actually how it's talking to it, more or less. It's about interpreting. Okay. This for the framework. Now, to explain generics, I need a specific notion, namely the notion of expectation. And this is a claim. Actually, this is something I would claim even if I were doing truth conditional semantics or whatever. This claim is independent of the accidental framework I'm now working in. Okay, this is the claim. There are many grammatical expressions and constructions, the meaning of which you cannot explain without explaining how they affect people's expectations. I will give one example that has nothing to do with um, generics. That's the evaluative use of gradable adjectives. So gradable adjectives are vague. They give imprecise characterizations. Like when somebody says John is tall, you can say how tall exactly. Okay. That's the kind of vagueness that most philosophers at least talk about. In linguistics, people are, have been much more aware of the other use, namely this evaluative use of, if I say John is two meters and three centimeters, you can say, wow, that's tall, right? And, and if I say, I run a 3,000 meter steeplechase in 19 minutes and 58 seconds, you will wonder, is that, so, is that fast? Notice that here you know exactly how fast it is. Right? You know, you have a very precise description of how fast I run the steeplechase. Still, you wonder, is, is this fast? Actually, I can tell you, it's very slow. The world record is, I think, seven minutes. Okay, so only gradable adjectives can use, be used in exclamations, like here, what a tasty dessert you prepared, what a stupid man he is, how tall you are. You cannot say how two meters and three centimeters you are. You cannot say what a digital watch this is. Maybe if you stress the watch, <laughs> you can do it, but... Not if you stretch the digital. So how do these evaluatives get their evaluative force? And this is 
the kind the kind of explanation I would give that tall roughly means taller than you would expect, and unless you have evidence to the contrary, you would expect somebody to be neither tall nor short. That's the normal case. And then when you notice, wow, which is taller than I would expect, that's okay. <coughs> So, something else that's important uh, about expectations, and actually that makes them interesting to philosophers, philosophers tend to talk only about beliefs and knowledge, and not so much about expectations, and it's a very interesting attitude. Well, actually when you do, I'm, 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 I'm looking at the... <laughs> And then I say, oh, no, no, they talk about expectations too when they're Bayesians, for instance, <laughs> in philosophy of science, but not in philosophy of language or in epistemology or words we have. Um, so look at this. They can be normative or epistemic, right? So here, I expect you to be at home before midnight. We expect a lot of rain this week. Actually, I can say to you, I expect you to be home at midnight, imagine you're my son, and then tell my wife I don't expect he will be at home at midnight. Like you can have, okay? And we, we mix up these two things. Like when you turn the key in your car, you expect it, the motor to start, and then when it doesn't, you kick your car as if it's been naughty, I don't know. <laughs> So, and then also, if we don't mix them up, our language does it for us, right? We use the word must, both for epistemic and for um, the ontic thing. So, that must be the milkman, he always rings twice, is epistemic, you must believe me no matter what the people might say. It's normative. The thing is, how do you, who does this for you, that you interpret, you interpret the one normatively and the other epistemically, it's not a sentence that does that for you, right? That's important here. So, and this is important for the rest of the talk, so that we are always in a, in a state where we expect things as normal as possible given the information at hand. That may be already very abnormal, but then still, in that situation, we're still looking for the most normal cases that we can get. So, um, about at what time did I actually start? Uh, like 39. Like okay, 39. good. So, this is the basic idea I have about genetics. If an agent accepts a sentence of the form P's are Q, where P's are their plural, she will, every time she's confronted with an object X with the property P, Expect that X has the property Q rather than the property not Q. Okay? That's the basic idea. And that's uniform over, over all these sentences that I gave you. But then this will give me a, I have a lot of explanation to do now. Okay? how this fits with all, all these, uh, maybe you can already see the boys don't cry thing that has to do with normative interpretation of expect and so forth. So here's one example. So this is how it basically works. Suppose you, this is, all of you believe this. Tigers <coughs> orange with black stripes. You all have heard about Shere Khan and even maybe read the book, nowhere in the book it is mentioned that Shere Khan is orange with black stripes. But I'm sure you read the book with that in mind. So the conclusion the theory allows to draw you, I will explain in a minute more formally how, is that presumably Shere Khan is orange with black stripes. That's the normal case. If Shere Khan had been an exception, 
Kipling would have used it, said that. Okay? So it's also a, a way of economy here, that you have these, let's call it default rules, like this, to, that makes that he doesn't have to mention that. Now, in, in, it is important that the, the notion of logical validity that I'm using here is a bit different than the one I gave before. The, all the examples that I will be dealing with, you have to imagine that all you know is what I have mentioned in the premises. And that's all you, it could be that you will learn more. So for instance, you, you, it could be that you know this, and you know this, and then you start reading uh, Kipling and, or a different version, and the author tells you at a certain, and then you assume this, and the author tells you at a certain moment, hey, hey, here comes an exception to the rule. Then you cannot draw this conclusion anymore. So we're talking about the minimal state in which you know the premise. And you can, so we're talking non monotonic logic. That's very important to understand what I will do. Uh, here's the second example, and this I will, I will show you in pictures how the theory formally works. But first, I hope you agree with this. And you, if you, you assume adults have a bank account, adults have a driver's license, John is an adult, and you also know that John is an exception to this rule, you will not necessarily conclude that he is also an exception to the others. Okay? Now, let me tell you, show you how this formally works in the pictures. So, this is a state, a picture of your intentional state. A very simplistic picture. You only distinguish four kinds of objects. Well, actually, yeah. They're all adults. Black means positive, red means negative. So adults with a bank account and a driver's license. Adults without a bank account, without a driver's license, and so forth. Okay? That's your universe for this simple example. Then, the first thing I tell you is adults have a bank account. Then you start expecting an adult to be like this rather than this. Okay? So that's what the picture tells you. This is more in the line of ex your expectations than this. Okay. Next you learn adults have a driver's license. And it looks like this. These are um, best in line with your expectations. Adults with a bank account and a driver's license. These leaves. Okay. Then I tell you John is an adult. That doesn't tell you much. That just tells you John is somewhere here. At that point, you will say, oh, then presumably he has both a bank account and a driver's license. Next, I tell you, no, he doesn't. Oh, sorry. No, he doesn't have a bank account. Then these two disappear. And you're left with this possibilities for John. Now, the one most in line with your expectations is the one where he still has a driver's license. So you will still presume that John has a driver's license. Okay? That's how it works. So let me now do the first of these examples that I started with. First, while you can assume birds lay eggs without having to assume that birds are female. That works as follows. Birds lay eggs. Oh, the picture, I have the picture simplified by giving you also a strict rule. Only female animals can lay eggs. That's something you know. Okay, that means in the universe, and that's a strict rule, that's not, that's not a generic. No female, eh? no male bird can lay eggs. So that leaves us with three kinds rather than 
four kinds of birds. Uh, female birds that lay eggs, uh, male birds that don't lay eggs, and female birds that don't lay eggs. Then if you learn these two things, this will be your state. But that, that doesn't mean that you prefer that birds are female rather than not female. If, if you learn that, then, the, then this, if I would teach you this and you would believe me, then you state we change to this one, where you also prefer female above male. But since you don't that here, given our definition of logical validity, it doesn't follow from birds lay eggs that birds are female. Okay? So remember this notion of validity saying your state shouldn't change when you learn something. Okay? So, to do the next example, I, I, I sketch here the formal setup. I'm not going to do the fill in the definitions fully because I can think I think I can do it all by pictures. But basically, what you have to do to to define everything nicely is you start off with a set of possible types of objects instead of say possible worlds or something. And then what you have is for each subset of this set of objects, you get a, a preference ordering explaining what you expect for that subset. That's here. And then you have a notion of a generic property within such a subject. Actually, that's what I already draw. You, uh, some, uh, Q is a generic property in, in, in a set of kinds of objects if you never prefer Q to not Q. That's what this says. Okay? But this is the definition that's important. A frame is incoherent if there is a set of kinds of objects <coughs> in which both Q and the complement of Q are generic properties. So, you, if, if, if I would say birds lay eggs, birds don't lay eggs, that will be incoherent. That's not allowed. Okay? But that's a very weak condition. And I, I weakened this condition recently to this. I used to work with a much stronger one. So given this, I can um, tell you how you can see on, on, in the picture when something is coherent or not. So if I draw, would draw, be forced to draw a picture that is partitioned in two sets that are in no way connected, then it's incoherent. This is actually a little proposition that you can prove. But for the pictures, it means this. And for now, this is only important. This, okay? But just to tell you, actually, these slides just tell you, OK, there is a good mathematical setup here. So now I can explain this one. So this is valid. Elephants live in Africa and in India. It's impossible to live both in Africa and in India. That's a strict rule. This Mambo is an elephant. Presumably, Mambo lives either in Africa or in India. Um, that follows. There's, there's one fishy thing about this example, which is that we don't give names to, wild, uh, to elephants in the wild. Okay? And usually elephants that are not in the wild are not in India or in, that have a name are not in India or in Africa. So I hope you can abstract away from that. The point is, if I would add that to the premises, probably this wouldn't follow anymore. Maybe doing non monotonic logic, but so. And again, if all you know is this, this is valid. Let me show you why. So this is the picture. So in this picture, 
there are, again, three kinds of elephants. Ones that they live in, some live in Africa, some in India, and some in neither. No elephant lives in both. You expect the ones in Africa to live. Um, you expect elephants to live in Africa rather than in neither. Uh, you expect elephants to live in India rather than in neither. If you learn that mambo is an elephant, you end up... Uh, do I have that picture? No. You end up... This is what you know about Mambo, that, is, that he is here. Yeah? Oh, no, no, this is not what you know, this is what you expect. You expect him to be here, which is either in India or in Africa. Okay? See that? So, now the more difficult example. The difference between birds can fly and birds lay eggs. Okay, how can you accept this, knowing that only female birds can lay eggs? Well, actually, because you know that. Again, it's so important that this is non-monotonic logic that when Oh, let me ask. Let me ask you first this question. For me, it's a fact that as a child I thought all birds lay eggs. Then at some point I learned, okay, that only females. Maybe not for all of you, but for me, that's how things went, right? Then I learned that there were exceptions, but that only particular kinds of birds lay eggs, right? Anyway, so. The thing is, uh, uh, let, me, let me tell you how it's called. I first will, it will take some time to explain this. We have to talk about systematic exceptions. Birds can fly. Penguins are a kind of bird. No penguin can fly. Treaty is a penguin. What, given this, as a premise, what will you con conclude? Presumably, Treaty is a bird that cannot fly. Okay? You will not conclude that Treaty can fly because he is a bird. Okay? Uh, and this is what the theory I explained to you so far. Uh, <coughs> explains. Again, we have three kinds of birds here. Birds that are not penguins and that can fly. Birds that are penguins and cannot fly. Birds that are neither. If you learn that birds can fly, uh, you will prefer this uh, above these two. Okay? Then if you learn, and well, and then you know that, uh, I told you no penguin can fly, so the only penguins that you have here is penguins that cannot fly. So if I tell you we are dealing here with a bird that is a penguin, you end up here. Uh, this is your knowledge about Tweety, and you will conclude, oh, then presumably uh, Tweety cannot fly. Okay? Now I'm going to change it a little bit. So here we have Treaty is a penguin. Now I'm going to change it a little bit. Suppose I tell you Treaty may be a penguin. Where may, I use that as a model operator as it's consistent with everything I expect. Okay? That's and actually, I use it as, a, as a, something you should reckon with, with that possibility. There's also possibilities that maybe you don't have to reckon with, but in the theory, then you say might rather than may. Okay? So, 
may, in this theory, is a likely possibility, something to reckon with consistent with one's expectation. Might is an unlikely possibility, consistent with everything one knows, but not in line with one's expectation. Okay? This is actually what not so much formal semanticists, they mix up these two things. But in descriptive linguistics, this is a very well-known um, <coughs> distinction. I, I took here one quote, but I could give you more. And recently there has also been some psychological experiments where people have been tested for the differences here, and it's all in line with what I'm saying here. So then, this is the picture when you know that Treaty may be a penguin. You have to reckon with this possibility. So then, you will not you will not be inclined to conclude that he presumably will fly. Okay. So far, you agree. So now look at this one. Birdslay X treaty is a bird. That's because you all know all knows did this too. Male birds are bird, like penguins are a kind of bird. Male birds do not fly lay eggs, like penguins cannot fly. And then treaty may be very well a male bird. Okay? And again, so what I say, when you, when you judge arguments, when you do non-monotonic logic and you have to intuitively judge an argument, you have to be aware that in the back of your mind, all other kinds of things may play a role than the ones that we explicitly given there. For, non for monotonic logic or for ordinary logic, it doesn't matter because <laughs> background knowledge doesn't, cannot change things. Okay? Um, but this brings up a, a very um, important, I think, philosophical uh, conclusion, you know? So when we think about truth now and about accept acceptability, if you want. Um, well, actually, so the point was this is the same picture as the one I gave you before about penguin. So this, uh, that's the explanation. So what this example shows is that one cannot judge the ac acceptability of a generic sentence in isolation. The rule birds lay eggs is acceptable despite the fact that at least half of the birds never lay an egg because we know so many other things about birds and about laying eggs all of which play a role when we reason about particular birds. So all these rules taken together enforce that the rule birds lay eggs only applies in cases in which we are dealing with female birds. Okay, so if you think of, of a compositional theory of meaning and you want to go by truth, if you think of meaning in terms of truth conditions, and if you think of a compositional theory of meaning, then you have a problem with generic sentences because whether they are true depends on other sentences too. Okay, so that's a real challenge for philosophy, I think. And of course, yeah, most will say, well, that's why the theory sucks. <laughs> okay. Um, Oh, this is not important. I leave this out too. Maybe I skip this too because I'm. Uh, you will believe me. Let me go now to this example. The good. This is different. Here, the explanation I have, that I have to give is different because it really involves the word "good." That forces you to interpret it or. That as much as it doesn't enforce you. Anyway, so 
first question I have, suppose I said Dutchmen are good sailors. So a, suppose I had started, forget Dutchmen actually. There's a p kind of people you never heard about. Uh, I don't know. And I tell you, they are tall, blonde, and handsome sailors. Then I'm sure you would understand that as a general rule for all these people, not only for the sailors. Okay? So that is specifically for good that it gets this, that enforces, more or less, that, that you are talking about sailors. And now, what is so special about good? Uh, you can have. How does good differ from tall, for instance? So, for good, you can have John is a better sailor than Peter, but Peter is a better logician than John. For tall, you cannot have that. John is a taller sailor than Peter, then also Peter, and then that this would contradict Peter is a taller logician than John now. That's work, right? So good has this specific property. And actually, what I claim, and I really need it, need it claim to, to explain this example, is that uh, good, when you say X is a good P, that presupposes that X is a P. So, both the sentence X is a good sailor and X is not a good sailor, from both the sentences it follows that X is a sailor. And the reason is, if we're talking not about, if you don't know whether you, what you're talking about, you, have, you don't know how to interpret good. You don't know, good means nothing if, in a context where, where you're talking about, say, the non-sailors. What is it to be a good non-sailor? Right? So good is special in this sense. And there are only a few adjectives that are that way. So they are, they need to get to really know how to interpret them. Also whether they, do, whether they don't apply, you really know, need to know what the concept there is we are talking about. So X is a good P is presupposed X is a P. I need that one. <coughs> so, in the picture then, we get Dutchmen um, that are no sailors. We have Dutchmen that are sailors and good sailors. And we have Dutchmen that are sailors that are bad sailors. And we don't have For this one, the property, this property makes no sense. Being a good sailor within the set of non-sailors. Okay. So then, um, yeah, that's that's basically all you need. So here you see that in this picture, being a good sailor is only applies to Sailors. So then, being a good sailor only applies to Dutchmen. Just then, Dutchmen are good sailors. Follow. Okay. Now, um, the the one example I think. Um, oh, I'm still doing fine, right? Uh, the one the, is the, the example I'm going to head for now is the uh, prime numbers are odd. Um, okay, so how to criticize, now you have to think about when, what generic sentences do. Special properties of generic sentences. Actually, this, what I do now, is also independent for a large part of the framework and so forth. So the generic, so here's one thing I really believe. Generic sentences work well within biology. 
Outside that, it's a mess. It's all prejudice, all over the place. Okay? So, <coughs> the problem with generic sentences, they express rules with exceptions. So, usually, so then how do you, ex how can you prove that such a rule is not acceptable in a specific such a rule? Okay? Because typically, uh, uh, when you do that, people will say, well, that's an exception that proves the rule. Okay, here's a, a famous quote that you all know that already says that. Trump about a Mexican immigrant. Yes, some are good rules, but they are, you know, except that, that's the typical exception to the rule. He doesn't give up the generic because of these exceptions, right? Well, and you don't have to in many cases. So when do you have to, when don't you have to. Now here's my answer to that. What matters is the quality of the counterexample. So the rule is to supposed to specify an intrinsic, essential, innate property of the kind of object at issue. Especially in biology. Okay, you, that's, that's how this kind is created, designed, educated. So the exceptions must be explained away. You have for every exception, if you, you can explain it away, if you can explain how come this particular object has be, is it not like the normal object. There must have been an accident, something happened, okay, to that particular object. That's actually the idea. We go through examples, then it will be clear. First, I give you some, because that's what, about what normally people understand by intrinsic property. It's in their blood, blood. It's in their nature. Nowadays, what's very popular is in our genes. Okay, here are some examples. Generosity is in our blood. Women love shopping. It's in their bones. The Greeks have polit politics in their DNA. Don't blame men for looking at other women. It's in their genes. Okay? Only, there are exceptions, but then, this is basically what is special about these generic properties, right? So here are examples. <coughs> Tigers have orange-black stripes. There are exceptions. A particular kind of bango, how do you, is that the right pronunciation? Don't have black stripes. There are no real counterexamples because there is an explanation. Listen, this is what happened, not just to this particular, to, to a one particular object, but to the, this kind in the evolutionary history. This is how it came about, that's why, and so forth. There is a story there. Okay? Now, Suppose you believe that spiders have six legs and that I come up with a spider with eight and now you have to explain to me how this particular spider got these eight legs instead of what you think is the normal six. The other way around is much easier, right? How this particular spider got six legs rather than what normal is eight. You see the difference? So the thing is, for the six-legged spider, you can sort of explain, really, maybe even point to the poor accident, the accident that made it. Well, I didn't do. Uh, anyway, you so saw you mean what you see what I mean. So and the prime numbers are always the same kind of thing, you know. Two is not even by accident. That's the reason. You cannot tell me how, what happened to this poor number that it is even rather than odd. It's not an accidental property. So that's how that works. So the, it's really important, this 
all distinction between essential properties and accidental is really important to understand generics. And I think that's a very fishy distinction that really only works well in biology. And outside biology, it becomes problematic. No, no, it's a bad one. Yeah, because yeah, because two is not an accidental exception. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, then. There's other ways to talk. How much time do I have? Do you say? Oh, now, now it's 45 minutes, right? Yeah. Okay, let me do, oh yeah, let me do the boys don't cry thing as the last one. So, generics are sometimes used in this um, normative way, like boys don't cry, friends don't let friends drive drunk. This actually, I put in this because these are often used, but this you also, Maybe many of you never saw this before, and still you manage to understand that it's normative. Am I right? That's actually the title of a documentary, Dutch documentary, very famous, beautiful documentary. And so here I maybe don't understand, but actually you see that in the theory that I sketched, it's possible how they can get normative because we have these expectations and we're dealing here with normative expectations. Rather, but, okay, and now we still need to, and still need an explanation why in this case it's sort of exclusively um, normative, right? So, I have tried various things here. So there are particular special things about this. First, it's all negative, and it's hard to find examples that are normative and positive. Right? But then I didn't get very far. Either. It's not, this is all activity. The, the other thing that I could try, it's so obvious that they are not acceptable in an epistemic, in an epistemic reading that you start to interpret them normatively. But you don't do that with, that's, that's probably part of the story, but definitely you're not going to interpret every generic that, did, that you don't accept epistemically normatively, right? So I have here, as I said, part of an explanation, but not a complete explanation. And especially why they are, where you get the exclusively the, uh, Here's, this is a mechanism that I want to, this, this word normally has this effect. So when you start saying people are normally heterosexual, nothing wrong with it, it's, as long as you see purely epistemic, right? But then the next step, there's something wrong with the A, and you start to use the normative sense of expectation, Okay. So here's my hypothesis here that our distant ancestors made no difference between normative laws and descriptive laws. Both were imposed by the gods, the first on human beings, the second on nature. So that's why all this vocabulary is mixed up. And even Galileo thought so. The Holy Writ and nature both originate in the divine word, the former as dictation of the Holy Ghost, the latter as an executor of God's order. So, it's a rather primitive way of thinking, uh, thinking in generic, that with, with generic normative, that's what uh, I think in the end. And let me leave it here. Thank you.